Welcome, friends, to another episode of The Chart Book. I'm here located in South Park, Colorado. It's Monday, September 28th. I actually tried to use this background on Bloomberg today. And the producer said, no dice, you got to change your background, Meb. Would have loved to have seen it on TV. So ended up with a picture from Colorado. Now back in Los Angeles. Uh, haven't done one of these in about two months. Uh, so we're going to try to run through some fun charts as usual. Send us some ideas, feedback at the show.com and we'll include some of y'all's charts and topics. Uh, today, we're going to do a quick whirlwind through what's going on in the world. First, I thought I'd start with uh, the sad state of Denver sports while we're on the topic. I'm wearing my Nuggets hat. They had a good run. The Broncos season is essentially over at this point, sadly, but they still have a sense of humor. South Park guys. Uh, had, I think, 2,000 characters at the stadium since there's not many in person, including Mr. Hankey, the Christmas poo. Um, but what's going on in markets? Well, markets are romping. You know, this is a chart of just some general funds uh, that are representative and from top to bottom, how they're doing this year. You got uh, momentum, not surprisingly, crushing it. This is Alpha Architect Fund ETF, QMOM, up a quarter this year. S and uh, precious metals up 20 as well. Then you got bonds and U.S. stocks. And after that, it's a laundry list of everything else being down like 15 to 20. We got real estate, X U.S. real estate, U.S. small cap value, and energy. So something's doing great, something's doing bad. That's the whole point of diversification, right? Well, um, but that's normal. We have a phrase we like to use called "normal isn't average." And if you look at strategists consistently, this is a point from Zero Hedge, but you know, we had said most of the time, if you look at all the return forecasts and going into this year, they were minus four to 10. You know, it's pretty rare for the S&P to actually end in that range. Only happens one out of five years. So we always said, if I wanted to be the best strategist, most accurate out of that group, you would simply pick return years really high or really low. But of course, no one does that because everyone loves to herd and of course the business risk, but stocks are already above the highest projection uh, of, any of, the, of any of the strategists, but that's because they're at all-time highs. And you know, I think a lot of people think all-time highs by themselves are bearish, but that's not necessarily the case. If you look, we did a paper this year, it's probably our least read paper called All-Time Highs. Are they a good time to invest? No, a great time. And this is a really fun paper because it looks at the possibly simplest and most basic investing strategy, which is you own an asset if it's within 5% of an all-time high, otherwise you sit in cash and it works phenomenally. Check it out. No one read it, but it's a really fun paper. Um, so the trend is up. The problem we have uh, with particularly investors in the U.S. is they extrapolate. So it's been a decade on of U.S. stocks romping and rolling and at all time highs. And what happens? Well, people just push that out to infinity and expect these returns. And around the world, investors expect, expect about 10% returns. Here's a Schroeder's expectation survey. And they had US being the single highest country of around 15%. I don't know if they were just polling Robinhood investors or what, but that shows a pretty poor appreciation for history as well as for valuations. You know, um, I would tell all of these investors to go read a couple classic books. Here's one, Stocks, Bonds, Bills, and Inflation. This is originally put out by Ibbotson. CFA puts it out for free. So if you go to cfainstitute.org, you can download this for a full history of stocks and bonds and inflation, uh, large cap, small cap, corporates. You can even download this in this spreadsheet. I'm sure there's some places online that have the Excel download, but it's free. Uh, awesome resource. There's the more expensive version, but my single favorite investing book, Triumph of the Optimists. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's over a hundred bucks. But the good news is you can get a free version of that too. If you go to creditsuisse.com, search for their reports and research studies and publications. Uh, there's my favorite yearly update, which is called the Global Investment Returns Yearbook. And they put this out. It's been probably over a decade. You should go read every single one of these for a full perspective of history. And they also have some fun reports about uh, family owned businesses, about wealth around the world, all free, all worth reading. Um, and so why are, are we thinking about uh, history, not just in the US, but globally? Well, 
part of it is, is the U.S. is only one country. You know, beginning of the last century, uh, at the end of the 20th, now we're the, the end of the 21st, um, we have, or beginning of the 21st, excuse me, we have, you know, a lot of different countries around the world. I don't think it was altogether obvious in 1999 that, or 18, 1899, that the U.S. would be uh, the standout country. But you can see a lot of countries, some did better in the U.S. for equity returns, some did worse. If you're sadly to be invested in Austria or Italy, and including a number of other countries that had massive drawdowns, you didn't return much. Um, and uh, so having the global breadth and opportunity set, I think is important as well as the perspective. And part of the reason why is simply valuations. And so this is a chart we publish a lot, which is US in the blue 10 year PE ratios adjusted for inflation versus the rest of the world. Uh, and you can see this massive alligator gap on the right side. Uh, U.S. is much more expensive than the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world is quite cheap and really hasn't participated since the financial crisis, but it's not always the case. You know, at valuations going back to the 80s, U.S. and foreign have been essentially uh, the same, both right at 22. At times, the rest of the world can be really expensive or cheap, uh, and at times, the opposite. Right now, we just have the case where the U.S. market is right around 30 which historically is pretty expensive. It's not crazy bubble like 99, but um, going back to this chart, you know, the Nikkei has had three decades where it struggled to work off uh, its bubble where it hit a P ratio of almost 100. This is, Japan was a major determinant of the 80s foreign ex-US valuations. It shows only 30s and 40s here, but that's because the rest of the world was uh, much lower valuation. You wouldn't even see Japan on this chart. It would be so high. Good news is foreign developed, totally reasonable. This is the end of June. We'll update this again in a, in a few days. Foreign emerging, uh, this is the average country for these guys. Market cap would be a little different. Foreign emerging, down around 12, and the cheapest stuff down around 10. You guys may recognize these flag logos. Uh, some of the cheapest countries in the world right now would be Czech Republic, in Spain, in Europe, uh, Poland, certainly in Asia, Singapore and Korea, and South America, Colombia and, and uh, Peru. But the good news is most of the world's cheap, uh, just not so much in the US. You know, and, and people love to come up with ideas why it's okay to buy really expensive stocks. And, and our buds at Alpha Architects showed in this study, you can click on through to the link to, to come up with full study that Buying things like stocks trading at 10 times sales on aggregates, aggregates a pretty stupid idea. Um, you know, it shows the universe, high expensive stocks. You may get a lottery ticket, but if you were to buy all of them, it it's really tends to be pretty foolish. Uh, another great read this month from Malbison, Public and Private Markets. He talks a lot about all the differences between IPOs and SPACs and direct listings, which everyone is fascinated with currently. Um, also shows valuations. Another topic I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, this is a different valuation metric, but traditionally they all say the same thing. You know, U.S. stocks getting pricey on enterprise value to EBITDA. The interesting part about this chart is everyone's moved into private equity, you know, as their savior, all the pension funds and endowments. And a lot of the uh, spread for buyouts, which used to be down around six times, has creeped up over the years to be at a record, but also... Um, much more public market like, which is an interesting observation. A lot of people, again, thinking there's a massive illiquidity premium by buying these LBOs may be uh, surprised. But part of the environment we're seeing now, you know, this reminds me of the late 90s a little bit with a lot of the value guys uh, losing their touch, quotes. Um, this is one of my favorite managers, Seth Klarman, to track through the government filings known as 13Fs. Institutional Investor had an article where a lot of allocators uh, are starting to get questioning whether they should invest with investors like Carmen. But these value guys go through cycles, but also uh, size goes through cycles. Here's large cap versus small cap in the times when large did really great, 90s and most recently 10 years. Another time, small has a good run. Everything has a season. You know, but again, everyone seems to want to justify this currently with a very basic thesis. And you hear billionaires talking about this all the time. I think Buffett often talks about it. I uh, heard Chamath talking about it on uh, CNBC the other day and said, you got to put equities in context of interest rates. So 
the funny thing about this is, is this is basically the Fed model. AQR had a good paper on this. If you find it old called Fight the Fed Model, you know, comparing stocks to, to nominal and real interest rates over time. And it's, it's nearly impossible to come up with a strategy that benefits. You know, there was a long-term relationship between stocks and interest rates during various decades, but in others, there's not. And it's really hard to tease out. Um, it's an idea that makes sense. You know, theoretically, it, it's a very basic and, and correct sounding idea. But I challenge you to come up with some strategies that really benefit from nominal interest rates versus stock valuations. The, the one caveat is people are willing to pay a little bit more for stocks when interest, uh, interest rates are mild by meaning inflation is mild. So when inflation is one to four sort of safe zone, that average, I don't know, let's call it 17 multiple or less on stocks bumps up to around 22. But again, that's not 30, it's not 40. Uh, but the problem with this statement is not all the things we just talked about. The problem with the statement is it doesn't hold for the rest of the world at all. So if you were to say, okay, well, if the pegs rates at zero, so stocks are allowed to be super expensive because bonds, are, you know, they're relative, they're cheap. Well, the rest of the world, interest rates are straight up negative and valuations are half or two thirds cheaper than in the US. So it doesn't make sense. It, does, it doesn't hold water in the rest of the 44 countries around the world, just in the US. So that argument's a little tough. Anyway, back to Buffett. Buffett's uh, finding a lot of value in Japan. Announced that he was starting to allocate to a bunch of the trading companies there, possibly because of valuation disconnect. Um, here's another chart. Again, this is world values versus growth. So this includes the US, of course. Uh, but showing we're ha having one of the biggest spreads in history. And it says going back to the nifty 50, which is quite a long time ago. Um, so, but if you're going to buy foreign, you know, it's always important to know what you own. If you're going to buy IFA or EEM, you know, realize the indexes uh, tell a story and all different indexes are different. This is one showing that, by the way, if you're going to just allocate to basic EEM, which used to be almost nothing, China is almost half. So you got to think about how you want to allocate, whether it's sectors, et cetera. Uh, our approach, of course, is to, to be more value conscious, but um, that's just us. So uh, one more fun idea, just thinking about investing, you know, the challenge for, I think, a lot of people, particularly when we're talking about valuations and opportunities, they, they want to talk about today, this week, this quarter, this year. And so much of this plays out over, over decades. This is a fun example in the 60s. Buffett bought a huge chunk of Disney, 4 million bucks, got you 5%. If he had just kept it, put away in a lockbox, that 4 million would be worth 12 billion. A 3,000 bagger. I don't know if anyone's ever gotten a 3,000 bagger. Uh, we did a poll on Twitter the other day, and, and most people have never had more than a, a 10 bagger. But Warren sold it a year later for 6 million, which most of us would be happy with. 50% return in a year. Amazing. But, uh, the really big long-term compounders often can take decades. Um, another good example of this, there's a fun podcast with Larry Hyde, who we've had on the show, uh, and Mike Covell, the, the trend follower. Also, we've had him on the show. And Larry's older, I think he's a billionaire, um, at the age where he just says whatever he wants, which is wonderful. Beginning of the podcast, maybe not so safe for work, but uh, if you go 20, 30 minutes in, he, he talks on a really interesting study he did. And this echoes something we did with, with Tom Basso, uh, which is basically that a lot of people spend probably 90, 99% of their efforts and struggles with what should I buy? Is gold a good buy now? What security should I buy? Et cetera, et cetera. They don't think as much on position sizing, risk management, and their selling methodology. Well, the cool part of what Larry talked about is he did a study where basically said, you can do random entries. It doesn't even matter what you buy as long as you have a thoughtful sell methodology. And Larry's, of course, a trend follower, uh, as am I and, and Covell. But the concept is letting winners run, cutting your losses short. Uh, you can apply that to a basket of, of almost anything and still make money, which I think is a, is a sort of most everyone 101 always wants to talk about what to buy. And, and that's important. Again, I, I think you could improve it by selecting a, a narrow universe of great companies. This is one of the reasons that private equity angel investing uh, does such a great job. And 
to a later to a less extent you know later stage is because you can't sell them and that's more and more i think a feature not a bug uh, the bigger problem with that of course is is the fees most private equity charges but uh but this concept of thinking about portfolio management risk management and how to sell i think is is, is an important one um but but again ownership in, in owning equities over the long period is you have to be in that game. Uh, we talk about ways to, to make that sustainable or survivable. We talk about a lot of, of tail risk, the ability of tail risk to help you just get to the finish line. If that insurance helps you uh, hold a portfolio of equities, then it's worth its weight in gold. Fun thread from uh, Joe Pompliano. Uh, and he talks about just, you know, one of my favorite topics is, is people that have leveraged uh, whether it's their salary or celebrity or status to become a business owner. Some of the top celebrities and athletes out there made most of their money through business, not through their actual day-to-day -day job. And this talks about a, a journeyman, six-man player in the NBA who made you know, strong salary, but turned it into uh, an empire of, of restaurants and is worth something like $600 million. Just such a, such a great story, demonstration of, owning and taking the long view in business. We talked about this in the Get Rich Portfolio, uh, one of my favorite articles of the year. This is back in March, so you may have missed it uh, as the world was imploding, but check it out. It's a fun one. Uh, it's part of a four-part series, Get Rich Portfolio, Stay Rich Portfolio, Investing in a Time of Corona, and How I Invest My Money. Um, but it talks about this, owning, owning the biz, holding the keys. Uh, a few quick hits, and we'll start to wind down. This one is, Knowing what you own. Charlie's talking about Ethereum. Everybody loves crypto. Since June, this is a while ago, it's up about 70%. But if you did that through owning the closed in fund, which can trade at significant premiums and discounts to NAV, you're down 80%. So uh, you always got to be thoughtful about putting on trades, particularly with closed in funds. We looked at the flip side. I rarely mention individual securities or funds on Twitter or elsewhere, but we were talking about Pershing Square uh, and money I was putting into that as a close-in fund. It was trading at, I think it was a 40% discount to NAV. It's probably still high discount to NAV. Moving on to other business stuff. This is a fun tweet idea. Um, Doug was a podcast guest. He's doing a really cool startup. And what they do is they go, if you're a business owner, a founder, a CEO, they go in and will audit your uh, business and tell you what incentive programs, government and otherwise, you are not taking advantage of. And on average, they save these companies 50 grand. So if you run a small business or even a big business and you haven't done this, it's free money on the table. They don't charge anything. They take a, a percent of the success fee. Check it out. If you guys go there, tell them Meb sent you. I'm curious and, and post on Twitter. We've, I've personally known people that have saved uh, 50 grand doing this. So I would love to hear what you guys come away with. Uh, some books in the mail for the fall time. It was about four. Schwager's got another Market Wizards coming out. Unknown guys. Looking forward to reading that. The Ritholtz crew's got uh, profiles of people writing about how they invest their money. Portnoy. Carl Richards, uh, looking forward to that. You guys know I've long been a big fan of being transparent. Most mutual fund managers don't invest anything in their own funds. Uh, Morgan Housel has got a book. Uh, Jesse Livermore wrote a paper, which is free, but his are all 100 pages, so I call them books. I got Morgan's wrong color uh, cover. There you go. Psychology, money. Looking forward to all these. By the way, speaking of content, if you're really bored this summer, fall, or stuck in quarantine, still, we put all of our best podcast of the week playlist up on Spotify. 300 hours of free content with some of the best minds. It's like getting a master's in investing. It's all free. 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020 so far. Uh, I think it's on the Idea Farm. Let's see what the name of this is. Yeah, you go to the Idea Farm. Uh, it's got all these just great podcasts. I mean, so good. Some of the top names. I mean, look at this. Bill Sharp, Howard Marks, Mark Andreessen, Ed Thorpe, Ray Dalio. Are you kidding me? Uh, all free. What else? What else? Uh, some funny tweets to end it. This is a funny one. Twitter is LinkedIn for people who want to lose their jobs. 
it's hard for a lot of people to behave. People compl- consistently behaving in a way that would cause my grandmother, talking to people would cause my grandmother or mom to slap me. I did a fun post, didn't get really any responses as usually the ones I care about don't, but did, did a, a post on some of the coolest startups or products in the past year that made you stop in your tracks and think, holy shit, that's brilliant. So I posted five of mine. I've invested in these companies. So take it, uh, my bias as it is, they're all private, but I invested in them because they're doing such cool things that I was excited about. First one is Axiom Space. They're building the world's first commercial space station. How cool is that? Uh, And not like 20 years from now, they're starting to put this to work this decade. Second one is check out Papa. This is an idea that's one of my favorite themes for this decade, which is mental health, loneliness. Uh, It's an idea of, I mean, it it sounds uh, funny when you say family on demand, but it's basically pairs uh, screened and vetted college student age, and maybe it's developed from here. Um, It started in Florida with uh, elderly, you know, people that are lonely and they may not have family or may need to go to the store or do things, just want to play chess, want to hang out. What a cool idea. I love it. I think this is going to be a billion dollar company. Uh, Osseum, building a global, starting with US, bone marrow bank. That's a great idea. Baller TV. This is a fun one. And and I imagine they struggled during Corona because they all got shut down. We did a fun uh, podcast with League Side. But these guys allow you to stream, live stream new sports. I mean, how much uh, single parents where the parents are divorced or where there's parents living, uh, grandparents, cousins living elsewhere, I'd love to see someone's high school basketball game or football game or gymnastics. And so they can live stream all these. And think of all the other use cases, of course, college, recording, points, yada, yada. Um, Steezy, online dance classes. Uh, what's the biggest problem with dancing? Most of us are terrible at it. Also, there's a lot of shame. Last thing you want to do is go dance in public. People uh, not really willing to let their hair down. Steezy lets you do dance classes at home, and it's good. Check it out. Uh, again, if you sign up, tell them Meb sent you. Maybe they'll give you a discount. This is a fun stat because it's always like you hear something going on in the media, and I was freaking out about this. California, uh, everything was on fire. We were driving through Santa Cruz, and it was just awful. And the air quality was just horrific. I actually have an air quality sensor in my house because we live on a road that's pretty trafficked. And I'm kind of concerned about, I have a gym in the basement, which is on the road and it actually has pretty bad air quality. But then when the fire hit, it was extremely bad. Uh, But it's a funny, just to look back in history and and you can find these archived monthly. And because of technology, uh, you know, that we used to have no catalytic converters on most cars as bad as it got uh, over the past month was just like a normal day in the eighties <laughs> and in LA. I remember growing up in Colorado and it was just a brown cloud downtown every morning. So gross. And it's funny how quickly you get accustomed uh, to, to wonderful things like clean air. Uh, what else we got? We got a few more. This is another one kind of in line with the, the main street. I know people love to give me crap for this cause I tweet about it too much, but if you haven't done it, Check it out. A lot of people don't know that state governments uh, have billions and billions and billions of dollars of unclaimed assets sitting on their books. So if you move, you used to live in a state, it could be insurance claims, it could be dividends, it could be water bills, all sorts of stuff. And so if you go to unclaimed.org uh, and you can search your name, your family's name, your grandparents, your neighbors, if you want, ex-girlfriends, whatever, We've helped people find over a million dollars of unclaimed assets that they've forgotten. So check it out. Uh, And just to prove you, I'm not making this up. You can look at my Twitter history. Here's somebody, uh, Jack, saying found five policies, 37K so far. I think the biggest claim, single claim was 80K. One idea is we've had financial advisors go do it for their clients. And I guarantee you, if you search your client, and find that here's another one, 1500 bucks. Um, if you find a client who you find free money from the government and then they get that back, that's a client for life. No reason not to do that with all of your clients every year. If you find any guy, anything, guys, hit me up, shoot me an email uh, or tweet at me. I'd love to know what you guys find. 
Lastly, I, I like poking some of the big real money institutions around the world. Calpers continuing to have quite a bit of drama, fired their CIO. We had done a tweet over a year ago now where we said, hey, pension funds that are struggling with underperformance and major costs, complexity, headcount, tell you what, this offer stands. I'll manage your portfolio for free. I'll buy some EV ETFs. I'll rebalance it every year or so. We'll even do an annual shareholder meeting over some beers. I used to say pale ales, but they give me too much of a hangover anymore. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Pilsner Kolsch guy now. And then I said, maybe I'll write up a year in review. Hit me up. So far, CalPERS hasn't called, but uh, we're, we're holding out hope uh, that they will. Uh, you know, this concept of complexity and cost, I think a lot of uh, the trends and the struggles with the Harvard and CalPERS of the world is going to be a big trend. All right, winding down, guys. It was fun as always. Uh, hit me up, feedback on thatfavorshow.com. Would love to make this a more consistent uh, program, the chart show. As always, best of luck, friends, and good investing.